Um, we heard some great things today about, um, about LNG, about LPG, and um, what, I'm, what I'm here to tell you is um, something different. It's uh, um, what, what, um, so what, what, we're, what we're saying is that there are cheaper and greener fuel alternatives available to the shipping industry. Um, those alternatives require openness of mind. They require to look beyond what we know in this industry. It requires you to look towards uh, shore-based generation. And if you do, then, uh, then besides all those um, negative impacts which we heard about earlier on this morning from uh, electrical cars and um, in, in, impacting oil market, um, we, can, we can learn from that industry. We can understand um, what, are their, what, what are their opportunities. Um, the site came a bit, a bit premature, but um, um, let me draw your attention to something. Um, I believe that available to us is the cheapest, the cheapest energy source available to us is actually man-made. It's not a fossil fuel. If we take waste as a source of energy, and if we prepare it in such a way that it is use, usable and useful, then we can have free energy source available to shipping industry. And I literally mean free, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, not only is free, but it also has substantial environmental benefits. So the fuel, it comes in granular form, so it's a bit like this. I've got the picture there as well, because it's hard to see. I've got some samples um, in, in my bag at the back. But this fuel produced from um, domestic waste, produced from commercial waste, is essentially 40% biomass by calorie value. Um, it is uh, it's biogenic carbon, so it actually reduces your carbon emissions as you take energy out of it. Um, it has very low sulfur by construction, so it has 0.3 sulfur, so you don't need scrubbers, you don't need abatement. It has low NOx emissions, um, because uh, it's, it's not an internal combustion engine process. So we are, in a sense, uh, to put very simply, we are saying, let's go back to, to a steamboat, you know, a modern steamboat, but a steamboat, so there's no internal combustion. The, um, if you don't have compression ignition, you don't have NOx, or not such a huge proportion. So the modern legislation or modern limits for NOx control for land-based, for shore-based power generation, are about 100 times more stringent than IMO tier 3. Just, uh, so if you take a land-based technology, you are able to comply with IMO requirements without much of a, with much of a problem. Um, a serif energy credit, that's, that's what it is called, um, an abbreviation, it is, uh, it's got desirable characteristics. It, it's, uh, it's mechanically stable, it's uh, standardized to size, it, um, it has got high density, which allows you to have a decent storage area for energy aboard the ship. Um, it's got similar color calorific value to LNG, so it's 20, 21 megajoules per kilogram, um, and it's comparable to coal. We all know how to burn coal uh, aboard the ship to, to to propel, propel the vessel, you know, it's, uh, it's not rocket science. Um, it's uh, tolerant to wet environment, so you know, it's a uh, very, very simple that, uh, you know, proof that uh, that the pellets uh, survive in, uh, in a moist environment, so they're not scared, and like biomass pellets, um, to exposure to rain and moisture, and they're biologically stable. Um, they do not biodegrade, so the pellet that I'm holding in my hands has been produced uh, five years ago, and still here. Um, it, uh, it doesn't have all the, all the problems that uh, people commonly associate with waste, like smell or any other issues. That it's, it's not uh, the process that prepares the pellet stops all of that happening. It's widely available. So land-based generation has has actually um, been using waste-generated fuels um, for century, for for decades. Um, the pellets are widely produced in Japan, Northwest Europe, Canada, and USA. An interesting fact is that. Um, each person sitting in this room, and it, as if uh, the same as every single member of OECD society today, produces one ton of waste per year. Um, out of that one ton of waste, you can produce, after recycling, after after you've done the best possible thing you can do with it, you can strip out and make 200 kilos of pellet. So that's 250 million tons of pellet you can produce globally, compared with 250,000 ton, million tons of uh, fuel oil that that uh, that the world consumes. I'm not saying that it can substitute every single barrel of oil that we need for shipping, but uh, I'm saying it is a meaningful amount of energy available to us should we choose to open our mind and embrace it. So the burning question, um, so how do you use these things? Um, the, 
let's look at solid fuel technology evolution. Obviously, um, start of the 20th century, we had Scotch, um, Scotch marine boilers, very simple, we, uh, manually fed boilers. Uh, the, um, earlier on in the, in the presentation, the, the reference was made to, to the second oil crisis from the early 80s when the, when the slow steaming was invented. Um, together with slow steaming, what we also invented was, um, was a uh, second generation of, um, of coal fire ships. Um, uh, the, one of those ships is, is demonstrated here. Um, it's uh, famous in some circles, uh, River Point. So that is a 1980s built um, coal fired vessel that, um, that was carrying iron ore around the coast of Australia, fired by Australian coal. Um, it was in economic service until, until its retirement in 2012, so 30 years of constructive, productive use around the coast of Australia, uh, carrying iron ore, fueled 100% by coal, using, using the moving grade technology. Um, we've, they, since the 80s, nobody has really tried to build solid fuel ships, um, and, but solid fuels are used um, quite often for, on land-based generation. So, um, so what I'm saying is the land-based technology has evolved. And it's perhaps time to look at it again, uh, given the, the huge cost differential that exists between uh, the energy that we've got available to us as a society right now and uh, the price we're paying for the bunker, um, especially after 2020. Right, we, we are working with some of the leading uh, research institutions to bring this uh, land-based technology to, to the marine environment. So, so we've got a, obviously, we, we are in partnership or in we're working together with the University of Newcastle, University of Cambridge, University of Nottingham, some of the best schools that are available out there to try to um, marinize this technology and make it suitable uh, for use. We are talking to UMass and uh, Innovate UK with regards to preparing a full feasibility report for various sectors, because no sector is the same. You know, one technology that is applicable for cruise lines is not applicable for bulkers or, or tankers, so we're, we're trying to find a sweet spot um, for, for this technology. Um, again, the, the complexity of, of, of switching fuel is, is huge, obviously. Um, you, know, you, you might be saving 40% um, of your global, or global cost uh, by not having any fuel cost. But what does it do to your revenue? What does it do to your, um, to your maintenance, depreciation, capital repayments? We have got comprehensive models which uh, model different scenarios, and I'm happy to engage with the delegates on a private basis to, to work out you know, what, how, how this fuel could work for your particular scenario, and um, if, if, that's what, if, if that's what's relevant. So what's next? Um, so what I'm saying is that the total industry fuel bill is uh, is in excess of um, 150 billion dollars a year. So I'm saying, saying here that some of that fuel bill can can be wiped out. How do we achieve that? Um, the only way to achieve that is through collaboration. The, you know, no no company would take on the project of um, um, of reinventing the ship single-handedly. So uh, what what we believe in is um, is uh, forming an innovative uh, collaborative. Uh, um, collaborative network around this, a bit like Project Forward that, that was rewarded yesterday by, um, by the um, Green for Sea conference organizers uh, for, as, as, a, as an innovator in this space. Um, so we, we are looking for the, um, for the players who would come in from a ship owners background, uh, the port authorities, uh, the boiler and turbine manufacturers, we're, we're looking for research bodies. Um, and we, we essentially have done a hell of a lot of background work to, uh, to, to put it all together. We've uh, patented some of the aspects of enabling technology surrounding this. And um, now we, we're asking, um, we are building a, a collaborative and we would like people to join, uh, join our effort. Um, where we are, so the technology, if, if in the in European framework, um, the technology readiness level is the way you classify technology. So we're the same, we're somewhere between tier five and tier six. So the principles have, um, have relevant principles have been observed um, in the lab scale and uh, in the land-based technologies. And uh, also, if you draw references with, uh, with the coal fire ships from the 80s, like River Point, which I referenced before, um, it, it would be quite easy to modernize that type of arrangement and, uh, and make it workable in the modern world. Um, but we were in the dialogue with the industry stakeholders and with, uh, with some of the largest ship in the ship 
um, shipping companies in the world, uh, what, what they said is they no, no orders will come until we build a prototype. So we do need to get a tank demonstration, we do need to get a, um, a, a workable prototype model and that's, um, that's, that's what we are here to, to start doing. So I use this conference to essentially announce a creation of a collaborative effort to, to, for, for the industry to come together, pull, pull its resources and, uh, and give this uh, quite an exciting opportunity, a chance. Um, so we've already defined a number of work programs. So the big, by far the biggest work program that we've got in our hands is, uh, yeah, is the adoption of a marinization of a modern combustion technology, which is a fluidized bed technology predominantly, um, and adoption of that technology to the, um, to, to the operational constraints of, um, of the shipping industry. Um, we, we're obviously working with the naval architects uh, to, uh, to see what the implications of the, such a big technological change would have on the layout of the vessel. So we're working with the Tritec Marine up in Glasgow to try to work out an optimal, optimal arrangement for the vessel. Um, the, just, just, just to put it in perspective, we, the design of the vessel has been, uh, has been limited to some extent by, by, the, by the direct uh, driving shaft arrangement. If you are generating energy on one side of the ship, and if you if you can pump either steam or electricity uh, to uh, to the propulsion unit at the back of the ship, that, that that potentially changes everything. You can have a very different layout for 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 the fuel stores. You can have very different architecture layout for where where you generate energy and where you just redistribute the energy to for propulsion. Um, so. Many other things that need to be considered, obviously. Um, uh, we, we've heard a lot from the panel today with regards to infrastructure. Well, the infrastructure for, for having and dry bulk materials is there. You know, and any port has got, got a grab crane. Of course, that it would be more efficiently handled using pneumatic conveyors with pneumatic transfers. Um, obviously, the, um, one, one of the other sponsors, my brand, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of technology for, for conveying solid fuels and, uh, and all those technologies are mature and developed and they're usable. There's no cryogenic, cryogenics necessary um, and it's, yeah, so there, there's plenty of things to do. Um, where we are, so we're, we're gone through a planning stage, so we, um, we, we work with summarize the technology, we've, um, we've uh, established and patented uh, some of the key enabling elements of the technology, um, we've sought legal advice and tax advice as to how to structure a collaborative approach. Um, the, there are two benefits of collaboration. One is that we prove and uh, deliver um, a knowledge um, to, to the wider industry, but of course, uh, members of the collaborative uh, uh, team, um, they, or collaborative consortium, would want to benefit from the, uh, from the IP rights from the intellectual property created. So we, we have got structure available um, that will allow us to, uh, to commercialize, um, to wrap up and commercialize the structure. So, um, as the next phase for the next uh, three to twelve months, we're going to be doing some detailed engineering, um, and, um, and after that, we're going to be looking to build a demonstrator. But uh, what what the experience from the 80s teaches us the the time that has that was taken for the solid fuel coal-fired vessels to be brought to market after the oil crisis was less than four years from the conception to the brand new vessels being built and um, and being put to productive use. So this is not the technology that is um, that is purely theoretical. This is not the technology that is uh, um, that is particularly complicated. It's, it is an update of a well-proven and tested technology, which I believe can save you money and make it easy to comply with IMO regulations at the same time. Thank you.